Hi, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua from Bloomberg TV, and I'm absolutely delighted to host this next panel for the next 45 minutes. So now you'll have a chance to ask, of course, uh, questions to the panelists directly. So welcome from everyone watching us from the four corners of the world at home or in the office. You can just send questions directly through this chat. As we all know, 2020 has been quite a year. Governments responded swiftly to the COVID-19 pandemic by providing fiscal and monetary support, as well as by loosening certain regulatory requirements on financial institutions. This leadership panel will really try and assess the current health of the financial system, what we can do better, uh, hopefully what we can do to avoid getting worse, and of course some of the potential emerging financial risks resulting from these historic interventions. We'll also try and reflect on how industries and governments can now work together to make key financial institutions more resilient in 2021. Now we'll have, of course, some great perspective from central bank, um, private equity, and the banking system. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Mary Erdos, Chief Executive Officer, Assets and Wealth Management at JP Morgan, François Villeroy de Gallo, Governor of the Banque de France, Jess Daly, Chief Executive of Barclays, and Kyu Song Lee, Chief Executive of the Carlyle Group. So very warm welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, maybe just a broad question to get us started. And Jess, I'll, I'll start this one with you. Where do you see the dangerous fault lines for the financial system? There's an understanding that actually we're in pretty good shape, that this is not like the last crisis, but is the system anywhere less resilient than we think? Well, I think you have to uh, give credit uh, to the regulators and to the, and to the changes that were made to the financial system post the financial crisis of 08 and 09. Uh, you know, the banks uh, were, were really the catalysts for, for the financial crisis. And I think the, the, the clear path that was laid after that crisis was to shift the burden of financing economic growth away from bank balance sheets and into the capital markets. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, what we're witnessing now demonstrates that that, in fact, has happened. Um, uh, and, and so the government response to this pandemic and its uh, resulting economic crisis um, uh, is much, much different than, than, than what we saw in 2008 and 2009. And the monetary policy and fiscal policy response to the pandemic has been unprecedented. Uh, uh, you know, uh, central bank balance sheets are twice the level that they were at the height of, of the last financial crisis. And they have taken that liquidity. And also they have, you know, they are using instruments that, that quite frankly, were, were against the law 12 years ago. Um, whether it's buying corporate bonds, whether it's the Federal Reserve buying mortgage-backed securities, um, that has injected an astonishing amount of liquidity, which has kept the financial markets going and allowed uh, corporations in very difficult situations to continue to finance themselves. So I think that you know, perhaps the, you know, the greatest case in point is, is, is the airline industry, which has obviously been one of the most directly hit has been able to fund itself, both in the public equity markets and public debt markets, um, because of that degree of liquidity. So I don't, you know, I think we're showing a financial resiliency on the back of central bank activity, which is quite remarkable given the scope of the pandemic. Governor, talk to us a little bit maybe about how you saw, you know, March 2020. You know, suddenly the pandemic's hitting, you're suspending these economies. What was it like as a central banker having to take these you know, difficult and delicate decisions? Uh, hello to everybody and thank you to Jess for what he just said and which I share, obviously. Uh, we try to be efficient as central banks in monetary policy and we probably come back to monetary policy later. And as regulator too, uh, and this was a major difference with the previous crisis, we had Basel free, fortunately, and it's very important that we stick to Basel free for the future. Uh, if you remember one year ago, there was some music on both sides of the Atlantic saying it's time to relax Basel free or to change the rules. I don't think it's time to forget about Basel III, it's time to implement it completely. And it was an excellent protection. Uh, perhaps to answer your question, Francine, uh, about the risks, uh, there are still risks, so we must remain very vigilant. There are many outside the banking sector at present. If I can mention briefly three of them, 
The first one is part of the non-banking sector, money market funds, some open-ended short-term funds, which had liquidity problems last March, and we shouldn't forget this lesson. Central banks had to intervene exceptionally and to create some moral hazard. So we should change, uh, draw the lessons and change the rules for the future. Uh, we draw the lesson for the banks from the previous crisis. We should probably draw the lessons from some short-term funds from this crisis. Second, a possible overvaluation of financial markets, or to put it differently, a possible discrepancy between the level of valuation and the economic prospect. We know there are many uncertainties. When will the vaccines come and be fully successful? So it remains a potential source of volatility and fragility. And third and most obviously, uh, the main vigilance we must have is about the solvency of non-financial corporates. Uh, and this could be a risk in the month to come for the financial sector. Mary, how do you see, thank you, Governor, and we will talk a little bit about monetary policy a, a little bit later because I do have questions on that too. Mary, how do you see the resilience right now of the financial system? Do we need to do more? H have we been complacent in any part of the market? No, I think Jess's comments and the Governor's comments were, were exactly right. I mean, this is the first time we've had a recession in the last 40 years where the immediate question wasn't about bank insolvency. And so all that work that's been done, not just by the regulators and the central bankers, but by all the governments and the banks in terms of liquidity and capital, it, you know, it worked. Jess talked about how fast it was. It also happened in record time. We used every acronym we invented back in 2008, and we used new ones. And the liquidity and the capital was just not, not the question. The, the, the question was really, there's this... A joke that a regulator sort of brought up to us in, in a comment that you're always nervous when a regulator comes up with a bank, but he said banks are like the Scottish taxi joke. And uh, the guy gets off the train station at 3 a.m. in a snowstorm and he goes and he looks and there's one last taxi sitting there and he says, oh, thank goodness. And he tries to get in and the taxi says, oh, no, you, you can't get in. I'm, I'm just the taxi that's supposed to be here. So there's always one taxi here. And it takes a minute to digest that, but I think what, what they're saying is with all of these buffers that are around the banking system, how do we make sure that we are using them in these times of stress? Because the central banks are the ones that made up for the, the, the short-term pressure and the issues. Um, and we have to find a way to help the banking system, if and when it was a banking crisis or is a banking crisis next time, that you can tap into those buffers. You can tap into those uh, central bank fed window as a, for instance, and not have the stigma that's normally attached to it and not have the risk that there's future consequences. And so I think that the focus, um, as the governor said, is really not so much on the banking system, but maybe could we refine it so that it helps in the next crisis and then really turn our eye to the areas uh, of places like unregulated entities, uh, perhaps fintechs and the like. And I think that's that's where the next area of focus should be in terms of those regulations and making sure we don't have the next future problem. Kisong, do you agree with that? Are there parts of the market, you know, away from banking that need structural reform? Yeah, and, and look, I would concur that, uh, that I, I, look, I think our banking system is, is, is very healthy right now. And I think the, uh, the central bankers by and large have done a, a, a terrific job uh, with a crisis that none of us uh, could, could foresee and, and, and still we're working through it. Um, but if you take a step back, the bigger issue, I think, is how do we get the economy going again? And how do we start growing? And, and where do we find the ability to invest the dollars into the companies that need capital? Uh, and that's where I think you see private capital come into the equation to make loans to the small and mid-mark companies that that can't get access to capital right now, or to grow, uh, uh, help partner and grow companies that are trying to uh, uh, create new business models, new systems uh, to deliver products and services that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that people want and businesses want. Uh, and so uh, to me, it's less an issue of, of, of systemic health in the banking system and whether 
uh, the regulars have done a good job or a bad job. I think they've done a good job. I think we're at the limits of potentially what central bankers in and of themselves can do, because the type of issues that we're all needing to fig, uh, focus on are structural in nature. You know, it's our infrastructure. It's how do we fix healthcare, uh, our educational system. These are not issues that that the governor can solve or that a bank can solve. Uh, these are issues where you need government policy leaders, politicians, fiscal, uh, smart fiscal uh, uh, leadership, uh, smart regulatory authority. We got to all work together to figure out how to solve these really tough structural problems. Um, so I think that the issue of of the last crisis. Uh, the system, uh, the, the health of the system and, uh, and the banking sector, et cetera. I, I don't think that's the issue, really. It, it's a different set of more structural issues uh, that are at play. But, Kusan, you, you worry about zombie companies. So we haven't really quite figured out what kind of recovery we will see because of this uh, stop and start with lockdowns, because there are questions about vaccines. And so sure. what happens to companies? Well, when central banks pull away, what are we left with? Sure. I, I think it's a really good point, Francine. I would say if you go back to the last financial crisis, and this is just a, a very high level of commentary, I would say you had a, a situation where you had a lot of uh, solvent companies that were actually illiquid. And so we had issues in the economy. I would say right now we may have the opposite problem. You may have some insolvent companies that are actually liquid because of what's happened over the past year. I think these are real issues that are going to have to be worked out, um, uh, counterparty to counterparty, do I think they pose uh, systemic risk? No. Do I think we're seeing rotation occurring in the economy uh, and changes where certain sectors are growing uh, and others are facing structural decline? Absolutely. Uh, that's what happens in vibrant economies as uh, you see rotation, as you see new technologies, as you see new disruption. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, you're seeing, um, because of this uh, dislocation, uh, the effects of uh, uh, gr uh, greater uh, inequality, you're seeing polarization. You're, and these are the fundamentally difficult issues uh, that, 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 uh, that our leadership needs to help uh, solve. Yes, what, what do you see in the real economy? Yeah, so uh, on the economy, and, and, and as we were talking um, uh, uh, before this session started, Let's see what happens with the new variations on, on the virus. Uh, let's see the effectiveness of the vaccines. Those are, those are big uncertainties which seem to be growing by, by the day. But if, in fact, we can um, start to wrestle the pandemic down, um, um, I think there's a chance, in our current view at, at Barclays, is you could have quite a robust second half to this year. Um, you know, if you go back to the, you know, to the Spanish flu, which is probably the greatest pandemic of, uh, uh, of the century, you know, what that led to when it finally got um, uh, arrested was the Roaring Twenties. And there was just an explosion of demand uh, coming out of that. Uh, and when we look, you know, you look at the balance sheet of a J.P. Morgan or a, or a Barclays, there's just enormous stored up uh, purchasing power. Uh, consumers are, 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 are decreasing their borrowing and, and increasing their deposits. Small, you know, small corporates are doing the same thing. And there's just a huge amount of pent up uh, uh, potential consumer and business demand, which once, uh, the, back, uh, uh, once the virus begins to uh, uh, be dealt with, uh, could in fact actually do pretty strong economic growth. I'd go back to what uh, 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 Song said. I think the challenge is it's very unequal in terms of how, uh, how the economic response, both fiscal and monetary policy, is hitting different parts of the economy and different parts of society. And, and perhaps the greatest risk is not an economic one, but a social one. Uh, and those that are being left behind um, um, for all sorts of structural reasons, um, uh, I, I think that's, that's where the, perhaps the greatest risk is. And, to a certain extent, I think you've seen signs of that, particularly in the United States over the last couple of months. May governor, I? When you talk, Francine? yes, go ahead, Governor. Yes. No, uh, about economic policy, uh, I tend to think that we need probably to reconcile the two greatest economics of the last century, Keynes and Schumpeter. And they're often <laughs> opposed. 
but uh, we need to be at once Keynesian and Schumpeterian. Keynesian, obviously, to give general support through fiscal and monetary policy, and we shouldn't pull away the support too soon, no cliff effect. Uh, I'm not especially worried about that, but it's obvious, and including the welfare state. And speaking from a European perspective, I think the welfare state is an asset in this crisis, referring to what Jess just said. We will see what happens in the United States, but there are interesting lessons also from the European model. But we need also to be Schumpeterian, and let me stress that uh, on the corporate side. As Q Wong said, we probably go from a liquidity phase, uh, which was across the board an emergency situation, to a more solvency phase, which must be selective. The recovery cannot be a mere restart. The reconstruction must be a transformation. Uh, and we will have this question of equity. We will go from loans, state guaranteed loans, which had massive amounts in my country and min many other ones, to selective equity injections with probably a public-private partnership. There will be public guarantees or public injection also for this equity, which is a bit of a paradox, but which is necessary. But I would plead against a 100% public funded or guaranteed equity. It would be very dangerous. We need some private skin in the game in order to be selective. We must focus on firms which have a, a, an economic sound base, but which are financially fragile due, due to the crisis. And this will be very difficult for politicians. Um, Governor, a reminder to everyone, you can send questions. Um, Governor, overall, I mean, you warned about also bubbles in financial markets just minutes ago. We heard it many times for central banks. Do you feel like you're listened to as a central banker? So you've done so much in 2020 as a central banker. Are politicians, are market participants listening to your warnings? Uh, this is a good point. Uh, we voice. are not responsible for the whole economic <laughs> policy. Uh, we are responsible for monetary policy with one single objective, uh, which is price stability. Uh, we care about financial stability. Uh, I could elaborate somewhat about that. But on the level of debt, on structural reforms, we can only give advices. We are not the deciders. And it's the right thing. It belongs to democracy. Uh, I can elaborate a bit more later uh, uh, about uh, monetary policy, which is, again, our core business. Let me say one thing about fiscal policy. Uh, you remember, Francine, that for years, we as central bankers have asked not to be the only game in town. And it was a case, especially in Europe, but also in the US and elsewhere. We asked for fiscal policy to play a greater role and also reforms. What we have seen, thanks to the crisis, is some kind of recoupling of fiscal and monetary policy. And both of them acting in the same direction, stimulating the economy. This recoupling is a good thing. If you allow me an image, uh, I am in favor of permanent marriage in my private life. It happens to be so, but this, this is only, I wouldn't say a personal accident, but a personal occurrence. Uh, in the case of fiscal and monetary, I am in favor of flexible couple. Today it's necessary, but we shouldn't take it for granted for the next decade, we must be able, uh, if there is an inflationary risk, to be independent from uh, fiscal policy. Our role is not to sustain and support fiscal policy forever. And this is probably an important message for government. Again, in the short run, uh, convergence is needed, welcome, and granted.
Governor, I want to ask Mary um, something on some of the things that we need to look at, and then I want to spend a couple of minutes on your actual monetary policy because there are, there are questions that ha have arisen. Um, Mary, how do you see this? I mean, the governor was also pointing, as, as was just earlier, to some mismatch of excessive, I guess, leverage and liquidity in some funds and investment vehicles. How does this get addressed? Yes, well, leaving um, marriage policies aside, what the governor said was exactly what they were supposed to do, and the, and the monetary and the fiscal stimulus worked, right? It was an explosive backdrop of stimulus that comes on, globally coordinated, and there we have a not surgical approach to what we want to fix. We, we, we have to take a, a blanket approach, and therefore you, you have natural froth in the system. And there's only so much you can do about it. Now, that causes all sorts of bubbles. Asset bubbles come and go, and there's lots of conversation about things like Bitcoin and SPACs and GameStop and other companies and what's happening. Those are asset bubbles, much like the crisis of 2000. And those, they, they, they can end badly, but they don't affect the actual economy. They don't affect the actual banking system and the stability and the security that we're talking about here. Credit bubbles, as we talked about, can, and they can be the bigger warrior. And the capital markets are pricing in just that. We've got the, the aggregate as, as a summary of the overall bond market have, having negative real yields right now. We have really, that's telling us there's a scarcity of lending. There's not as much out there as uh, what people need to put their money into to be able to diversify their portfolios and to be able to protect the overall diversified asset allocation that they have become accustomed to and they're in search of yield and they're trying to make up for it. And so we have to worry about the unintended consequences of what happens to that end investor. And the end investor is where it can go very wrong. And some of these things just haven't been battle tested. You think just in the US, um, there are companies like mortgage fintechs and there's a mortgage uh, foreclosure moratorium. So we don't have any idea what that's gonna mean and how that's gonna play itself out. Uh, but that's where we really have to figure out where there are no rules and there are becoming access to the banking and financing market. Where, where are things not tested? How can we get ahead of it? And where can we make sure that we're, we're not allowing those things to happen because that's where it really affects the end the end user. Kusong, what does that mean for private markets? Is it, is it an opportunity or is it a challenge? Yeah, I think it's mostly an opportunity. Um, and, you know, everything that the governor said, I, I, I kind of agree with in the sense of uh, we need smart public-private partnership here. But there are market-based solutions to, to, to a lot of this to just get the economy going again. Um, and, you know, when, when you think about creation of of new companies, new business models, ways to uh, to improve healthcare, uh, ways to 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 uh, uh, do online education, ways to to uh, to improve basically uh, people's lives in, in a world that's been disrupted. Um, you know, private capital is funding a lot of that. We're, we're the ones who are are, are helping uh, management teams grow. Um, we need smart regulation. We need thoughtful fiscal and monetary policies, which aren't trying to solve the issues of yesterday. They're focused on the issues of tomorrow. And we do need coordination amongst our leaders to do that. Um, I think Jess brings out a really good point, which is I'm, I'm less concerned really about the old issues of the banking system. Um, I'm much more concerned about issues around social stability, not financial stability, um, of uh, how do we figure out how to... Uh, get trust back in government, uh, because government is going to be an important solution path moving forward. Um, I think there's no more important thing that can be done right now than solve the healthcare crisis. We're not done with that yet. Uh, we're very early days, and I think it's very clear that you cannot solve and fix the real economy and get that going again until you can get the health of our people all set up the right way. So. So there's, there's lots to do, but I do think the private markets and private capital are actually a huge source of, of, of opportunity and redirection of capital to the uh, elements of, 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 of the economy that uh, are in need of it uh, and that can use it to grow. Uh, and with smart political leadership, I think uh, we've got a good shot at, at resetting and, and, and getting, the, getting this all going in the right direction. So maybe to take Governor, the... if you'll... 
Oh, yeah, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Jess. I mean, sort no, of go ahead and then I'll go to my You know, I do think, um, um, you know, you can have this this very aggressive fiscal and monetary policy um, um, uh, that we are having, anchored by the fact that interest rates are effectively zero, if not in most in many G seven countries, negative on a, on a real basis. And, 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 and so you can run massive deficits and, and grow central bank balance sheets to uh, an unprecedented uh, degree if you don't have to pay any real interest. Um, uh, the issue I think to focus on is where is inflation? <clears throat> and, and I think part of what's creating the fact that, that there, right now the bond market is not pricing in any inflation is because uh, we're not seeing pressure in, in the labor market, which is the other side of that income inequality issue. What is generating massive uh, financial returns right now is intellectual capital. Labor is not being paid. Um, uh, that's keeping inflation low, keeping the bond market comfortable uh, uh, and allowing governments to run these deficits. But I think as everyone said, from the governor to Kusan and Mary, you know, we've got to start investing in a way that deals with the income inequality issue. And it's a timing issue of, you know, getting people to work uh, with, with, with wages that allow someone to afford uh, to live. The price of that might be on the back end, you're going to get some inflation, you're going to get the bond market to move. And then all of a sudden, you know, government's borrowing for free. Uh, uh, um, uh, may not continue forever, and that and that may be the ultimate economic challenge that, that we face. Thank you, Jess. Governor, if you'll allow me, I have a couple of questions on monetary policy that are maybe a little bit more immediate compared to, please, to what we please. heard last week. Said, so this is th my there was, <laughs> there was um, some confusion, or at least there were some questions uh, last week when the ECB actually moved its statement on PEP flexibility to the monetary policy statement. You say the envelope need not be used in full and could be recalibrated. Are there any limits on to how much you could deviate from that envelope? Uh, perhaps, Francine, uh, to, to give some clarifications on our monetary policy and keep it very simple. Uh, we have one objective, hence two commitments, and accordingly a broad range of indicators. And let me elaborate somewhat uh, and, and give the uh, answer to your question. Uh, we have one inflation objective, uh, which is both medium term and symmetric. It should not completely ignore past uh, inflation developments, nor should it be a ceiling. Hence, to put it clear, URA inflation could in the future exceed temporarily 2% without triggering mechanically a tightening of our monetary policy. And then to reach this inflation objective, as I said, we have two commitments. Uh, our first one is clearly to maintain a very accommodative monetary stance as long as necessary. Uh, but besides the monetary stance, let me stress our second commitment on monetary transmission. We want to ensure a full transmission of this accommodative stance. This is what we mean by preserving favorable financing conditions across jurisdictions, across channels, banks and markets, and across borrowers, visa, governments, corporate or households. We want to prevent an unwarranted tightening of fragmentation uh, triggered by adverse exogenous shocks or excessive volatility. We, which brings me to the point you made and uh, the indicators we look at. Accordingly to preserving these favorable financing conditions, we are looking at a broad range of intermediary indicators on these financing conditions. Uh, it's multifaceted as we consider the path through to various uh, non-financial agents, uh, as I said. 
and we will be ready to use the all power of all our instruments, including, as you said, the, the flexibility of PEP. Uh, monetary policy is not only about quantities, uh, it's also about the quality of its transmission. And it is not limited to uh, one single indicator or one automatic rule like yield curve control. Uh, it incorporates judgment and discretion. So uh, I, I think these are the rules of the games and they are clear on, on our side. Uh, we will adapt to, to uh, the evolution we will see with a very clear focus on our inflation objective, guaranteeing a very accommodative monetary state stance and an adequate transmission of, of this stance. And, and both legs are important. Governor, on that, a couple of questions, I guess, from market participants is, you know, if you keep financial conditions favorable, does it raise the risk of diverting your attention away from your inflation goal to focus on that, like you've just explained? And who decides actually currently no. what favorable conditions are? If I may, Francine, re react on, on your first point, and it's very important to react. It's why I insisted on monetary stance and monetary transmission. Our goal is and remains inflation. And as I said, right. uh, our objective is midterm and symmetric. And I was extremely clear about that. Why do we speak of financing conditions? Because preserving favorable financing conditions are the conditions for a full transmission of this accommodative monetary state. So it's not something new. Uh, is something perhaps we stress somewhat more. And again, looking across the addictions and across channels and borrowers, it's why we need a broad range of indicators. But it's um, the ways and means to, to achieve our inflation objective in a symmetric and medium term way. That's clear. Thank you, Governor. Jess, when you look at you know the changes in banking, how, how difficult as a chief executive is it to you know have people work from home? D does it make it more difficult to assess risk? Does it you know even you have Brexit? I mean, there's the landscape is changing. You know, I one I think if you had asked most you know if you'd asked Mary or me or most other bank executives. You know, uh, in uh, in January of last year, a a year ago, you know, uh, what would Barclays look like if we sent 55,000 of our 85,000 employees home uh, to work from their kitchen tables? Uh, you would have thought that was madness. Uh, the extraordinary thing is, I think, how the financial industry and many businesses have actually been able to have the technology, have the systems, uh, have the controls, have the environments to allow, uh, you know tens and tens of thousands of, of employees to work remotely. And imagine if this pandemic had happened 15 years ago, none of this would have been possible in terms of allowing people to, to, to stay at home. So I think it's a, a, a remarkable testament to what the industry has done and what technology has allowed us all to do. We're thinking about what will happen when we get back to normalcy. Um, uh, you know, what will happen with uh, the office? I would say um, uh, that uh, over time, I think this working uh, remotely uh, with the majority of one's population, it, it, it will increasingly be a challenge to maintain the culture uh, and collaboration that, that these large financial institutions uh, seek to have and should have. Um, uh, so my bet is we'll have more people coming back to work. Uh, um, uh, you, you know, you'll have flexibility, but I think we started to have that in, in any event. Um, but I think it's, it's remarkable that it's working as well as it is, but I don't think it's sustainable. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, we're all experiencing, we've talked to any CEO around the world, they will talk about the remarkable resilience of their people. They will talk about the, the adrenaline that came from having to adapt so quickly. And companies did, people did, and it worked very well, surprisingly very well in 2020. 
I think if you ask anyone today, it feels like it is fraying. It is hard. It takes a lot of inner strength and sustainability each and every day to continue to focus and to not have the energy that you get from being around other people. And so we need to talk about how that world is going to work. And when we think about the conversation that we were having in the green room to prepare for this, we gotta, we really have to understand this disease of COVID and what it's gonna mean. And our chief investment strategist, Michael Semblist, had an interview with Stefan Bassel, the CEO of Moderna on uh, Friday, Thursday or Friday of last week. And he is talking about the word persistence. And so we need to talk about that too. COVID could persist for very long periods of time. The risk he does not see as much in a future pandemic as he does as a continuation of this one. And so with the range of mutations, it is unlikely you're going to get herd immunity to all the different strains. And so while the pharmaceutical companies are doing a fantastic job with the vaccines and the like, it's never going to be a perfect situation. The world is gonna have no choice but to open up and it hits on all of the comments that were made about this, uh, this divergence of people and their experiences. And you're gonna get very high risk of extremism coming out because of this restlessness. And so the world is gonna have to figure out how to adapt. And Kusong used the word uh, coexist with how, how we're gonna function. Otherwise, we're gonna be in a very dangerous situation across the world. Mary, is there a threat to finance from the transition into green technology, just a greener economy? And does it mean that we need to maybe loosen up some of um, the capital requirements to, to fund the shift to a greener economy? Well, you know, Jess and I and a, no a number of us are working uh, with WEF on the Sustainable Markets Initiative and trying to come up with the right terminology, the right language, the right metrics, all of the ways to think about what is the G in the, uh, sorry, what is the, what is the E in the E, S, and G? We've worked very hard uh, as an industry, all of us, on governance and making sure that governance uh, works properly across all of corporations around the world. Uh, we've worked very hard on, um, on the, you know, making sure that you have the right diversity and the right things within, within a company. The greenness, which is the environmental piece, is hard until you have the right common language. And when you have the right common language, you can get to the right place. But I don't think the world should rely on ESG to be making up the rules that really governments should. Because we have lots of companies around the world that are legally functioning. And then to ask for asset allocators or banks to be making the judgment on which are the right ones and the wrong ones goes against the way the legal system and the framework works for governments around the world. And so we really have to work in partnership. That's what WEF is spending so much time doing. And that's why bringing together industry, government, central banks, asset allocators, um, and the entire banking system together in a forum that we really wish we could be together in person this year, but we're not, but we're still having these conversations. And I think that's the thing that's going to, that's the thing that's going to make the difference. May I, um, I, I think you have a comment. Yeah, Governor, let me go to Kusong and then we'll come back to you, Governor. Okay. You know, Francis, well, let me just uh, raise just two or three very concrete examples, which takes a lot of what we're talking about and links it back to your, your topic. Uh, you know, first of all, on the on the whole green ESG um, uh, topic, you know, I think COVID has has been a time to accelerate these types of of, of initiatives and improvements. And and I can tell you here at Carlisle, we are putting in place lines of credit and or uh, bank facilities with the J.P. Morgans and the Barclays of, of the world, whereby actually our cost of capital drops the more progress we make on ESG initiatives uh, at our portfolio companies. Uh, and so that's a good example of alignment uh, where uh, uh, good things are happening, not only uh, at our companies uh, and, and our cost of capital, but also with respect to uh, uh, the environment. Second, it's an interesting point you, you raised uh, with Jess about return to office, um, Zoom, uh, Zoom fatigue, culture erosion. Let me just point out, however, and this is a point to the, your financial soundness and banking system issue. We've been doing billions and billions of dollars of financings with our banking partners. And 
if you take two day ro- uh, two week road shows or one week road shows and now can get those deals consummated in a day or two because of the productivity and the efficiency that's unleashed by the technology that takes banks off risk that takes capital off risk and hence in many ways is better for risk management and capital efficiency uh, with respect to the soundness of the system so so you know there there's there's a good part to this as well in terms of the the productivity and and the use of the new technology and i'm just trying to link it back to you for your, for your system on strengthening uh, and, and the soundness of the, of the system. And then finally, um, look, all CEOs are terribly concerned about culture uh, and what this is doing to our people. If there's, if there's one lesson I've learned during this whole time, it, it's the, the importance of empathy uh, for, for, for senior leaders as we're trying to guide our organizations through this uh, unbelievable crisis. Uh, the one thing I've I, I, I think is a great strength of conversations like this and use of this technology is on the one hand, yeah, it's challenging for culture, but on the other hand, there's unbelievable connectedness that can occur laterally where you are bringing parts, uh, all different parts of an organization that never before talked to each other, uh, breaking down silos, and that's actually helping culture and helping organizations communicate more in a more transparent way, which is also at the end of the day, not only good for culture, but better for risk management uh, as well. So I'm just trying to help you out, Francine, by bringing some of these very uh, you know, good concrete examples back to your topic of well, what does this mean for the financial system? Thank you, Kizong. Governor. Uh, no, two quick points on green. Uh, first, this is clearly a direction where we need to be Schumpeterian. Uh, and this crisis should be an opportunity to accelerate the ecological transformation. Uh, and not to slow it. Uh, and second, about green and finance. Francine, you raise the bond, uh, the question, will we need a green supporting factor? Uh, you will not be surprised that I'm quite cautious about that. What we need to do is probably twofold. First, to incorporate climate risk among financial risks. And as you probably we launched the so-called network for greening the financial system of supervisors in the One Planet Summit. Uh, we started at eight supervisors at central banks. We are now about 80, including, yes, the U.S. Fed since one month. It's not by chance. It's due, due also to Joe Biden's election. Uh, but the main message of this coalition of the willing is that climate risk is part of the financial risk we should look at. So it's uh, the normal view on risk. We we should never lose this perspective of risk. It's why I'm a bit cautious about the green supporting factor. And the second avenue we should follow is about monetary policy. It's very important. It's still newer. It will come. Uh, I personally am very committed to put this incorporation of climate risk in our strategic review of the ECB. I strongly hope the ECB can make significant progress on that and be a pioneer among central banks in the three to five years to come. Uh, Christine Lagarde is very committed in this field, as you know, and uh, we can change our economic models, we can change our collateral policy, we can change our purchases to incorporate this climate risk it will be a game changer, but always related with this risk spare. Governor, very quickly, actually, if if the euro strength begins to impact inflation, do you have a favorite monetary? Is is there a relation with uh, with green? Green? No, no, we're just throwing everything in 45 minutes. (laughs) It is Davos after all, usually, yeah. No, about the Would you have- rate, nothing new on my, no, nothing new on my side. But just to repeat what we said, including in our last governing council last week, that we monitor carefully uh, the implications of the exchange rate on the inflation outlook. Full stop. Fabulous. Well, that's all we have time for. <laughs> A very wide-ranging panel. So thank you all for joining us.